Oceana Cruises is one of my all-time favorite cruise lines, and so I was incredibly excited to try their new class of ships. Until I did. I went on Vista, the first of this new class, and despite many great things that I'll tell you about, there is, for me anyway, and some others I spoke to, one deal breaker that means I'll be sticking to their older ships unless something changes. Welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, helping you to get cruising on Oceana right. First, let me tell you about the many great things that I liked about this new class of ship. It's a great smaller sized ship, even slightly reducing capacity from their 1,250 passenger Marina and Riviera ships to just 1,200 passengers due to slightly bigger cabins and the introduction of some solo cabins. It's bright, modern, and looks and feels luxurious. Overall, I found it an easy and logical to find my way around with the main public areas on deck five and six, and then 12 and 14. There are a couple of quirks though, like the rear elevators not going down to deck five, where guests and destination services, shops, dining reservations, desk, and some of the restaurants are making it a bit fiddly to get to, but those are just small quirks. The pool deck has a great pool with lots of comfy lounges, although there's lots of complaints of chair hogs on my cruise, but it did feel busy, it did feel packed on the pool deck on sea days, but overall the ship didn't feel crowded at all. A huge positive were the dining options. Of course, Oceania have food as their thing, even using the slogan, the finest cuisine at sea in their marketing. I found a huge choice, especially for a smaller ship line, and even more than on the existing ships. All are included in the fare, which is fantastic. I want to talk about specialty dining first, as I saw that as a particularly big plus. On Vista, they have four specialty restaurants, one of which is proving, though, a little bit more controversial. There is Red Ginger, their Asian restaurant, which is also on Marina and Riviera, Polo Grill Steakhouse and Toscana Italian, which is on all of their ships, all have big menus, great food. But on Vista Class, they've re replaced Jacques, the popular French restaurant, with Ember. This I saw getting more mixed reactions, partly as people love Jacques on the other ships, but also I think it's not as clear a concept. They describe it, and I quote, as savory American classics come to life with a modern twist. And it's a little bit hard to figure out what that actually is, though I did actually have some great food there, but it did prove a little bit divisive. I could go to all of those specialty restaurants at least once, though higher grade suites can go as often as they want. Though I would say it is pretty hard to get bookings. As soon as online booking opens, passengers swoop in and they make them. I had waited a week before I went in and I struggled to get bookings, but I was able to finally get them sorted out once I was on board and went to all of them. In terms of regular dining, there are many, many options too. There is the Grand Dining Room, which is a beautiful large venue. I could always get a table, whatever combination I wanted. It was open for breakfast and dinner and for lunch on sea days. It has a massive menu at every meal. I really enjoyed it. The Terrace Cafe, is the buffet with an indoor and outdoor area open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's not a massive buffet, but a good choice. And it's all served by the crew, so it does feel very civilized and sophisticated. They also have themed dinner most nights, like Mexican, Asian, that kind of stuff. Then there is Waves Grill, which is open for breakfast and lunch, when it serves burgers, that kind of informal dining dishes. And then in the evening, turns into a pizza place. A new addition on the Vista class, which is proving really popular, is the Aquamar Kitchen, which is kind of linked to the spa more healthy. It's got an indoor area and a covered outdoor area with those slightly more healthy options. Although, to be honest, I did have things like club sandwiches in there. Then there's room service, which is great because it doesn't have a fee. They also have, which is my love and passion, daily afternoon tea served at four o'clock in the Horizon Lounge. That's up on deck 14 overlooking the bow of the ship. They come around with these trolleys with sandwiches, cakes, and scones. It can be a little bit chaotic because unlike some cruise lines where they bring the tiered stand with everything on, it can be a little bit hit and miss in terms of catching the cart as it goes around, but it is really good. Another venue I'm gonna include in dining is Baristas, which is their fabulous coffee shop. This is a great venue serving barista-made coffees, which are included in the fare. It has been expanded compared to Marina and Riviera to add a, a new section which serves fancy pastries and more exotic sandwiches, really nice. What I really, really liked about the Vista experience is there is a really wide range of options. 
even though it's a smaller ship. I loved having the informal places that were open in the evening. So if I just wanted a quick bite or something like, I could do that. I didn't have to go and book into a full restaurant every night. I really enjoyed the food. Now I did speak to a couple of people who felt the food was just okay. But I do kind of wonder whether Oceania actually kind of set themselves up for that because they do make such a big fanfare about the food. Personally, I found the food good and I liked the wide range of choice. The next thing that I loved is the enrichment focus, which again is true across all Oceania ships. There's a large well-stocked library with plenty of seating. It was popular and has a good range of books. They ran regular enrichment talks in their speaker series. Interestingly, every single Oceania cruise I've been on, it's been the same guest speaker doing the talks. So she obviously does them an enormous amount. But personally, I do find the talks a little bit overly academic, a little bit obscure, but I may be an exception because they seem well attended. Topics included things like the mahogany roots of Belize, a history, and love and war in Mexico, Cortez conquers the Aztecs. Also fantastic were the cooking classes in a large and impressive culinary center. There was a charge and they were unfortunately sold out by embarkation day because they could be booked online before the cruise and people swoop in. I did join the waiting list. I did get offered one eventually, but unfortunately I'd made other arrangements because I assumed that I wasn't gonna get in. They do things on these classes like French cooking, desserts, they have one called Passport to the World. It's a fantastic initiative, but it seems there probably should be even more to just cater for the demand. Another fantastic thing, which was also sold out mostly by the end of embarkation day, was the artist loft with an artist in residence. Now on this cruise, it was a lady called Pat Grillo. She ran classes on portraits, colored pencil sketching, and so on. So again, it's a fantastic initiative, but again, probably just not enough of them. They've added a new initiative called the Link Digital Center, offering digital trainings run by a really enthusiastic guy called Carlos. I could check out a tablet which has the classes on or go to a live class to learn things like photo essentials, mobile photography, landscape and travel photography, video making, Instagram and Facebook basics. They were included in the fair and the classes grew in popularity through the cruise as word of mouth spread around the ship about how good they were. So that's a good sign. So those were the things that I absolutely loved about the ship. But what about the things that were less good and importantly, of course, that deal breaker for me? Personally, I was less keen on the entertainment and found the program pretty limited and light, even on sea days. Although the main reason that I go on Oceania is for a small ship experience focused on dining, enrichment and destination. So this is not a deal breaker. One thing though that I did see that was really popular was that a lot of the daily program is structured around what they call their big O points. This is where at most of the events, guests could collect those points at doing things like trivia, playing bagos, shuttle, board, table tennis, other classic cruise activities. Then they could redeem them at the end of the cruise for merchandise, you know, everything from golf balls, keychains, baseball caps, t-shirts, tote bags, that kind of stuff. They do also have dance classes, casino tournaments, bingo, that kind of classic cruise stuff. But there wasn't a lot for those who were really looking to be entertained especially in the evenings. After the evening show, it was pretty quiet at night with not a lot going on. For me, that was fine. Uh, but I spoke to some people who were looking for more organized activity. So important to bear that in mind if you look at Oceania. Now, most evenings, there was a production show by the six person team doing very classic song and dance shows. Things like Music Triangle, a sort of documentary working through the history of jazz rock. They had another show called Into the Night, which is apparently choreographed by Dancing with the Star Pro, which is sort of reinventing ballroom dancing, supposedly, and a thinly disguised take on the famous choir man show called The Anchor Inn. Now, personally, I wasn't excited by the shows. I found them pretty standard, a bit dated, but that, again, is possibly a personal preference. They did seem pretty well attended and seemed to get a fairly good response. By the way, I did really like the casino, which was a decent size for a small ship, with a good range of tables and slots. But again, I'm probably biased because I did really well on the slots, but it's a good sized casino. They also then had things like crazy golf and stuff up on the sports deck. So let me talk now about the area that for me was a bit of a deal breaker. Now this has proven to be a little bit controversial because I did talk about it when I was on the cruise and both paths, Vista cruises and some on the ship did not agree with me. But I did personally find the ship 
has an issue with soundproofing between the cabins versus other ships that I've been on. Now I'm cautious choosing a cabin, making sure I'm surrounded by cabins above, below, and either side, first of all, to be away from noisy venues. And I do admit that I'm sensitive and picky about noise, and I do like really quiet cabins. However, of the many, many, many ships I've been on, of all sizes and all grades, I did find that my cabin on Vista had the biggest issue I've encountered with soundproofing between the cabins on any of those ships. Now, I do like my cabin to be quiet. I probably spend more time than many of you will do because I'm also working on cruises, you know, writing scripts, editing, posting, and other bits of work. But on one side, I could hear very clearly the discussions that people were having, not just kind of mumbling and rumbling that you get on some cruises, I could hear their actual conversations. Now, they weren't TV watchers, so I didn't have that intrusion. On the other side, it was a little bit more subdued. It was definitely less intrusive. By the way, in case you're interested, I booked a penthouse suite. I was in uh, 10049. Now, I did ask many people on board, pretty much everyone on board that I met, and many said that they'd noticed it too, though most people's issue was more around television noise. Now, of course, that's not a representative sample because I was actively out asking people about it and, of course, drawing attention to it. Now, I've been on other Oceania ships and other classes several times, and this has never been an issue for me at all. Looking at cruise critic reviews, I see this topic gets raised. I've seen other reviews by independent travelers on blogs where they talk about the issue. I've had a few people message me when they saw me talk about it who've been on the Vista saying they've moved their bookings from Vista back onto other ships like Marina, Riviera, and the other R-Class ships, which, to be honest, is where I am after my experience. Now, I have to admit, other people I spoke to said they had no issue or felt it was no different to the other ships they've been on, and they felt that the upsides of Vista that I've spoken about far outweighed that for them anyway. Now, I have to say I love Oceania for all the good things that I've mentioned, but because I'm so sensitive to noise in my cabin and I feel this is an issue on this particular class of ships, I'm going to book all my future Oceania trips on the other ships where I didn't experience this, which is a pity because these new ships are really beautiful. I will keep an eye on reviews and I'll see what other people are experiencing. Now, it may be an issue for you, it may not. So let me know in the comments your thoughts and experiences, especially if you have been on FISTA. I'd really love to know. Meanwhile, if you want to find out about another small ship cruise line, Windstar, that I was on recently and find out what they do well and not so well, join me over in this video where I start talking about what most people think about the line that's wrong. See you over there.